So I've had an interesting morning today. <laughs> I have two spectacles, two glasses. I lost both of them. Okay. And then I went for printouts. My father-in-law went for printouts, and his printer wasn't working. Then he went to a shop, but it's Diwali, none of the shops are open, so no printers, so <laughs> no notes <laughs> also. So finally, Joshua helped me with my notes, so I have my notes with me, but please excuse me, I'll be looking at the, my notes quite a bit because I can't read too well there, so yeah. So let me start. Um, today, the topic I'm going to be talking about is spiritual laws. Um, okay, sorry. So the credits uh, go to messages from Brother Zach Punin, Pastor Ashok, and the NLT Study Bible. Most of my message is influenced by them. And one more person who I never thank, because I'm always so caught up with my message, is my wife, Deepti. Yeah, because uh, you won't know, she's the one who actually prepares my deck, sets the message, types out everything, and I come here and stand. <laughs> So it's all her, she dictates and she helps me with every single thing about my message. So let me start. So the entire universe runs on laws, right? Whether it be the law of gravity, whether it be the law of thermodynamics or, or any other given law, you know, and God has made these laws. God has made these laws so that everything works on precision, you know. It's so much so that throughout a millennia, People have been able to predict solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, etc. So in the same way, our lives are also governed by certain laws, by certain spiritual laws. So I'm going to be taking the couple of next minutes to talk to you about these, some of these spiritual laws. The spiritual laws that I'm going to be talking about are the law of faith, the law of forgiveness, and the law of giving. So let me start. The first law I'm going to be talking about is the law of faith. The law of faith says, according to your faith, be it unto you. So let's read from Matthew 9, verse 29. Then he touched, touched he their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. So this happened when two blind men went to Jesus. And Jesus asked them a question in return when they asked him for healing. Do you believe that I can heal you? And they said yes. So then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. So basically what this means is the amount of faith that we have in God, the amount we receive. So that's how, that's a transaction that takes place. So let me talk a bit more. Let me explain this a bit more before I go further. So what is faith or what is faith that is needed right now? Let us read from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what is faith? Faith is basically, first of all, understanding and knowing that there is a God. That he is supreme and the God that we believe in is the same God who exists, the one and only God. This God is a good God. He wants to answer our prayers. He wants to give us what we need. And he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And one more thing, what Jesus introduced was he's our father. He cares for us like a father, a father who's ten times better or a million, infinite times better than any father that we can think of. So this is faith. We need to have this faith that this God who has called us to him cares for us. He loves us. He wants the best for us. He wants to prosper us. He wants us to be the head and not the tail. So this is the faith that we need to go to every time we are in a situation or every time we need something that is according to the will of God. So let me talk next about the, result, the results of faith. So there were two times when Jesus was amazed, right? So let me recount to the two times. The first time is when he went to Nazareth, his hometown, and he couldn't do much miracles because people didn't believe in him, right? Then let me read that portion out. He could not do any miracles except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Mark 6, verse 5 and 6. So over here you see that because of the lack of faith of people, Jesus could not do much. He was tied in some way to do more because people didn't believe in him. Now the polar opposite happens in Luke 7, verse 9 and 10. This is in regard with the centurion's faith 
of his servant who, sorry, let me repeat that. This is regarding the centurion's faith when he asked Jesus to heal his servant. So let me read that. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had, sent, who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So over here you see Jesus is amazed by the faith of a Gentile centurion. Right? He didn't even, I, I mean, him. I think he would have had some knowledge of the Jewish law because he built a synagogue for them. But this was a Gentile who had faith in him and Jesus was amazed with him so much so that he said that he's not found such faith even in all of Israel. So over here you see two polar opposite things taking place. First, in Nazareth, where he couldn't do much, and over here in the faith of the centurion where his servant was healed. So in the same way in our lives, right, we can either approach God with faith and believe in Him, believe that He can accomplish anything, move any mountains, do whatever it takes to rescue us out of the situation, or we can be like the people in Nazareth and don't believe in Him and just think of Him as an ordinary man. Faith is also a form of dependency on God and giving God control and knowing that He's in charge of everything. So let me give an example of my own life. Uh, most of my family knows about things that are happening in my life through my sermons. So uh, let me just start. <laughs> let me just start. Oh, this. I'm sorry. I'm really quiet in that way. So, okay. So maybe a year and a half back, um, God told me uh, to leave a certain thing from my job. So let me expand so I give you a clear idea. In advertising, right? In the advertising industry. We have, to put, we have a category called social media, right? So we have to put a post on behalf of the company. So one company um, told me to put up a post regarding the Pride Month. And I spoke to a lot of people and they all told me, you know what, Tarun, it's fine, no problem. You are not representing the company, right? This is the company who is saying that. And I went with it. But one day we had a prayer call. And in that prayer call, we were talking about the Pride Month. We are praying about the Pride Month. Remember praying for the people in the LGBTQ community, for saving them, for helping them, for people not being harsh on them, but also rebuking the sin that is in Pride Month. So when this happened, I was convicted again, and I thought, okay, <laughs> I don't think I should be doing this. Then I spoke to Ashokana, and Ashokana told me, yeah, Tarun, just go ahead, talk to your client. I went talking to my client, knowing full well I'm going to lose my client. Right, so I went to my client, and she is a big supporter of the LGBTQ cause. I went and I spoke to her, and she told me, uh, well, she told me it's fine, Tarun. In some way, she even respected my faith, and we went ahead. And I praise God and I thank God. But after that, three months later, what happened was God convicted me even further. This is my conviction, so y'all don't need to follow it. So yeah, it is God. God placed it in my heart to even stop doing posts regarding festivals. So when this happens, advertising is all about festivals. It's all about posting things for festivals, promoting it, etc. And I knew this time is not going to be easy. This time is going to be tough. I've got to take, the <laughs> I've got to take some major moves. Uh, so what happened, I had to do that. And God told me during this time, my times are in your... No. Yeah, your times are in my hand. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so, and that really reassured me. So, that resulted in a very lean time in my company. Uh, I had to let go of people. I had to cut salaries. I had to let go of a portion of my business as well. And during the year, on top of that, God even added more responsibilities to me. <laughs> so, I was like, the only way I can get this done if it's God is with me. And I kept on thinking about this word, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Right? So I just went with complete faith. And this faith, I have to tell you, didn't come from me. I'm a very weak human being. So this faith came from God himself, you know, and he put this faith in me. And it took time. It's been almost a year. But during the course of time, I started seeing God's work in my life. I got a client which deal with governments. So they did not have any of these needs. And I started growing, people saw my work over there, further government started handling me. So much so that nowadays, I, I told Deepti the other day, sometimes I have to pinch myself to realize the goodness of God and the people I'm working with. 
you know and this and this faith it's it's not just material church i wish it was just material but material is a big portion of it but i've never felt so satisfied with my work because god is making me do the things that he wanted me to do so it was a time it wasn't a short period either it was a year almost now of this lean period and god has just supported me every single time taken me through every single uh, payment and i even remember uh, a few months back right uh, it was a pretty it, there was a lot of expenditure that month and and it came to the beginning of the year and i hardly had any money even to pay my employees etc let alone handle the house and somehow god without i never let my need known to anybody else you know and somehow god who a loved one sent a word of cash <laughs> you know which just until my clients paid me you know everything was handled so god is good if we have faith in him he will reward us yes so let us go to the next point how do we get that faith i wanted to make sure that when i'm covering a topic most of it is covered you know every topic within that so how do we get this faith faith we need to pray for faith even um the passage if i don't if i might get this wrong but in the passage where there's his father with a, a son who was demon possessed he asked god help my unbelief right so we need to pray for faith faith is basically believing more in god and faith itself is a gift from god for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself it is a gift of god not of works lest anyone should boast for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared for uh, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them ephesians 2 was 8 to 10 i'm sorry i'm not on the right slide yes so we, as a, as i just read we need to pray for faith we need to ask god for this faith because it is a gift from god himself then the next point i wanted to talk about how do we get faith faith comes by remembering what god has done for us before all of us sitting over here are but a testimony of the good things that god has done for us god has taken us out of dark times times which have been impossible every week we see miracles in people's lives right so we all are here by just a testament to god's goodness so we need to think of past times when god has helped us before i remember this when deepthi was pregnant the first time with ethan she went through this thing called red degeneration so during this red degeneration it is she really suffered had a bad time it's unbearable pain you know and she can't even have high dosage of medication and this happened to her twice and each time it lasted for a week almost right and it was so tough on her and uh, it god took us out of it we have a very healthy and happy child praise god the second time during her pregnancy with mia the same thing happened right the same thing happened and uh, her red degeneration started and it scared me but all through this time i was telling lord i have studied a lot now it's practicals right so all i was saying is the same thing in the song that we sang i am a child of god i am a child of god god is going to get me out of this like he has done before and this time by god's grace it just lasted for a day or two and never came back so we need to remember god's goodness because he's been so good to us we can just draw but he's not going to change suddenly right he is if he's taken out before as before out of a tough situation he will take us out again yes the next point is how do we get faith faith comes by hearing extremely important we need to read our bible we need to understand god's word we need to understand god himself how he is his characteristics his goodness his love his discipline we need to understand all these things and this comes by hearing and hearing mean primarily means reading the word of god and apart from that also listening to other men and women of faith oh i'm so sorry because of this uh... okay the next law i'm going to be talking about and i'm going to spend some time on because i think we really need to hear this is the law of forgiveness the law states you won't be forgiven unless you forgive others 
Uh, Milin spoke this. I was so surprised. This is the exact verse that he spoke. So <laughs> clearly the Spirit is leading us. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So it's extremely clear that Je what Jesus has said. If you do not forgive others, God will not forgive your sins. So let me expand this further. Forgiveness is a very key part of our Christian life, right? People identify with Christians because of the forgiveness aspect. Even if you search, I was looking for images to search for in forgiveness, and even if you search for forgiveness on Google, most of the images you'll find is to do with our Christian faith. So it's a big part of component of the Lord's Prayer, no, of, of Christianity, and so much so, so that it's even the part of the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. Matthew 6, 12. So this is something that we need to do. We need to forgive people. Yeah? But one thing, one aspect of forgiveness, it's very hard. It's extremely hard. It doesn't come easy. Sometimes it's easy when it's a small thing. But most of the time, it's very, very hard. Especially when it's somebody who's recurring, recurringly hurting you. Especially when it's someone who's taking advantage of you. Especially when it's someone who's hurt your family. It's like your blood boils, you know. How am I going to forgive this person? There's no way, right? But I'll get to how to release that forgive, unforgiveness also. And, but I need to tell you, church, there's no way around forgiveness. There's no way. You want your prayers to be answered, you want God to listen to you, you need to forgive. And not, oh, sorry. And not only is forgiveness important, settling matters also is important. So let me read from Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave that sacrifice uh, there at the altar, go be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So over here, it clearly says you need to reconcile also. What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice can be a prayer. Sacrifice can be a gift. So before doing that, we need to reconcile. We need to set things right with people. I don't know how far this is always possible. For example, I was thinking, what if a telemarketer calls me and I'm rude to them? How do I get back? Right? And ask them for forgiveness. But the thing is, the main thing is to always remember that we need to reconcile as far as possible. Now, the thing is, there are a lot of excuses not to apologize to somebody. Let me just uh, toss, list out a few of them. That person really hurt me. It was not totally my fault. The person should apologize first. I didn't do anything. They did most of it. Let them apologize first. If I apologize, I will be the weaker person. If I apologize, the person will just take advantage of me. If I apologize, the person will feel what they did was right. All of them true, all of them valid, most probably that will happen. But it's our job to set things right and apologize. I remember this one time when me and my friends were out and we both had an argument, right? So we had this argument and they said some bad things to me, I said some bad things to them, I didn't give quite either. So, and the next day, I, this was during me getting back to God, right? So the next day in the morning, we all were traveling back to Bangalore and I apologized. I apologized to all of them, I'm sorry I caused so much havoc in the night, I'm sorry for what I did. And they told me, Tarun, it's okay. Don't worry, it's all fine. It's all good. Uh, let's have a good time here onwards. In my mind, I was like, what just happened? They should be apologizing to me. <laughs> and they are saying, it's fine, it's okay, they forgive me? <laughs> really? <laughs> so that's what always happens. <laughs> People are going to think that they are right, but let them think they are right. The thing is, we still have to apologize for everything wrong we do because we are setting matters right with God and the person near us. Most probably, especially with my family, I think deeply is tired of my sorries. <laughs> I really do think so. I mean, <laughs> next time I say sorry, I don't know what's going to happen. But, <laughs> but the thing is, I have hope that I'll get better, right? As I walk with God, I have hope that I'll get better. Yes. 
So one more thing, as Diana just read, we also need to remember that our struggle is not with flesh and blood. We do not fight with people. We do not fight with people on this earth, whether be they be of a different religion, bless all of them. Our fight is not with flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's who our fight is against. And that's what we are doing now. But let me say a, good, a few good things about forgiveness, right? An apology can mend relationships. An apology can set things right, destroy relationships. Over a year, all you need to do is just apologize and things can be normal. The love can come back. It's, I don't know, it's something between um, men. I don't know if women have the same thing. But we both, when we have a fight with each other, we just hug it out. <laughs> and after that, everything is fine, everything is forgotten, and we are all back on track. So apology mends relationships. Next is, forgiveness can release us out of many spiritual and physical bondages. This one line can be a message on its own, can be a series on its own, can be a conference on its own. Because it's so true, forgiveness can release us out of many spiritual bondages and physical bondages. I have seen with my own eyes, I have read, I have seen examples of forgiveness can result in physical healing. You know, almost immediate physical healing. The thing is, we put so much in that our heart is filled with that anger against this person. And the second we release, something happens in our body and health comes back, joy comes back to us. But the main point is forgiveness helps us experience freedom in God. So it is like this huge bag that you've been carrying, you know, like a 60 kilo bag that you've been carrying. And then suddenly it's released and it falls off and you walk in freedom. That's how forgiveness feels and helps us experience freedom from God. Now the next thing I'm going to be um, reading from is the impact of unforgiveness. Anugra, over here I'll need your help if you don't mind. Can you read from Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35? He could not pay, so he so the master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed to pay a debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all back. Then the master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded an instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. He pleaded, but the creditor couldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison, until his debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you a tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on a fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until his debt was entirely paid. And that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Thank you, Anagra. Really appreciate it. So over here we see that this king who forgave, who forgave his uh, servant, this king who forgave his servant, right, the same servant did not forgive his and show mercy to his fellow servant. So what happened over here, let me emphasize in verse 35. 
No, so what happened over here is the king brought back all his debts on his shoulders. So over here, let me read again, emphasize on verse 35. That's what my heavenly father will do if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So somehow, every time I remember this parable, right, I, it, it ends at verse 34. And I just didn't remember that Jesus said this. It's clearly said that if you do not forgive, God will put back the sins that he has forgiven back on your shoulders. Not that we have enough with unforgiveness, not that we have so much going on. Just imagine, this time it won't be a 60 kilo bag, it'll be a 200 kilo bag on your shoulders. So that itself should be a reason for us to forgive, so that because God, who, have show, who has shown mercy on us, will put back the sins that we have done before against him. The next impact of unforgiveness is from Ephesians 4, verse 26. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Ephesians 4, verse 26. Dear church, I cannot emphasize this enough. Please read this. Read this again if needed. Let me read this again. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. So, Ephesians 4, verse 26. So this verse has worked like a mathematical formula in my life. Every time there's unpleasantness between me and Deepti or a loved one, or there's some fight, or there's something going wrong in my house, invariably something will go wrong. Right? Because we are Christians and the devil is waiting for a foothold, waiting for a foothold to come into our lives. So every time there is this power, the, uh, this unpleasantness in the house, or I have said something in anger, or I have done something in anger, I just see something go wrong. And as Suni Chechi says, most of the time it happens to the loved ones around me. Right? So it is very important for us to repent, ask God for forgiveness, reconcile things before the sun goes down. What does it mean by before the sun goes down? During those days, basically when the sun went down is when they went to sleep. Basically, before you go to sleep, I request you, dear church, settle your matters. Settle your matters with God, settle your matters with people, so that God can show you His favor, so that you can actually claim His mercies are new every morning. Right? So we need to remember this, we need to forgive, we need to settle matters, because devil is, the devil is just waiting for a chance to come into our families to cause havoc, and let's not allow him to do that. Yeah? Now, the next point I want to talk about is how to overcome forgiveness, unforgiveness, sorry. Number one is how do we overcome, as I said, forgiveness, forgiving people is hard. So let us ask God for grace. God is not leaving us alone in this battle, right? We don't need to grit our teeth and I'm going to forgive that person. Ask God for grace. God understands that this person has harmed you. This person has caused you harm. He's taken advantage over you. He's repeatedly causing you harm. Maybe a boss who continuously takes pleasure out of getting after you. You know, but we need to ask God for grace because if He's commanded it, He will give us the grace, He will give us the strength, He will give us the spirit to overcome it as well. Right? So ask God for grace. The next point is remember how much God has forgiven you. This is a passage that um, over the past few weeks is coming over and over again. It basically is a passage where an immoral woman comes and wipes Jesus' feet with her tears and with her hair. Let me read from it. I tell you, her sins and they are many have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. I want us to dwell in this passage. The people who know that their sins have been forgiven find it easier to forgive. Over here Jesus says that, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. But the fact of the matter is all of us have been forgiven much. It's just that we do not acknowledge how much we have been forgiven. We compare ourselves to somebody else. Every sin, every bad thought, every anger, every lustful thought is all sin that Jesus went onto the cross for. So we need to understand how much God has forgiven us. 
I'm not telling you to dwell on your sins in the past, but just a glimpse of it will re- make you realize how much God has forgiven us. And when you see how much God has forgiven us, you will see how little that other person has done to you. Right? So we need to dwell in how much God has forgiven us. The next law I'm going to be talking about is the law of giving. The law is give and it will be given to you. Let me read the whole thing. This from KJV just has a bit more impact. Give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. Luke chapter 6 verse 38. Basically, putting it in simple words, if you give, God will give you back in abundance. So over here, I'm not going to be talking to you about how to give, who to give, where to give, which agency, which institution to give, how much to give, because it's none of my business. Right? But I'm going to be talking to you about the law of giving. So let me first start off with a bit um, with the characteristics of giving. Right? This law is not restricted to just money. Yes, material goods and giving money is a part of it. We cannot discount it. But it's not just about giving money. It's about giving your time, giving your care, giving your efforts, educating people, empowering people who are in need. Right? It's a lot of things, and it's not restricted to just money. Recently, I heard a message from Billy Graham, which said that you need to tight your time. I was like, Two, and a half, 2 hours 40 minutes, if my math is correct, a day. And I'm learning to do that. I'm learning to do that because it's everything. It's giving back to God, right? And it's just not, again, as I said, it's just not money. It's a lot of things apart from that. Now, the next point is very important. Giving has a lot to do about the way, about the way you give. So we need to give with a grateful heart. We cannot give with a bitter heart, right? Because if you give with a bitter heart and you say, ah, grudgingly 10%, then this thing, then after taxes, before GST, all of that, if you're going to do that, you're giving with a bitter heart, right? It is almost like a dead work. Give with a heart which is open. Give the way God gives you, right? So that is giving has to come from a place of gratefulness, a place of joy, and a place of abundance that you realize God has given you. Right? And the third characteristic is the way you give shows the God you worship. Right? The way you give, right? If you are stingy with your giving and the, how much time you spend with people and help out other people, give monetarily, shows the God you give. Because you think your God will only give you so much blessings. 10% of his blessings he'll give you. That's it. You know, so that's how you, so now when you realize that your God is a giving God, you will give more. So your attitude and how you believe what God is reflects in your giving. Now you might ask me, right? Okay, so if you give to God, God gives you an abundance. So one of you might ask me, or maybe let's just say XYZ person comes to me and asks me, but Tarun, I've been giving 10% I've, after my taxes, everything all good, and uh, I'm also trying my best to walk with God. Yes, God has given me back a lot more than I have given him. But the thing is, if you think about it, my neighbor, he's got a Ferrari, he's got a big bungalow, but he doesn't do anything. He doesn't give or do anything. So over here, we need to remember, let me just give you an example. Now suppose one of you gives a kid a slice of cake. Okay, when you give a slice of cake to a kid, that kid is not going to share it with you. Okay, you won't even share it with a sibling. Uh, I've seen it. So. <laughs> so, they love their cake. But this kid is a sweet kid. He gives a portion of his cake back to you. Okay, and you think of it. Okay, wow, such a sweet kid. Oh, I'm so nice. Will you give that kid the rest of the cake? I mean, it's bad, right? It's bad for the kid to eat the rest of the entire cake. In the same way, God knows what is right for you. It's just that we don't see, we keep coveting, we keep thinking of other people. Think how much God has given you. And that will show you, right, how the God that you worship. Let me get on to the next point. The next point is, sorry about that again, how to give more. 
this has helped me. By also, just to let you know, by seeing this message about giving in no way, I give a lot, right? I'm battling it as much as a, any other person right here. So what helps me is realize that nothing you have is really yours. We need to admit it, we need to internalize it, especially as Christians, nothing you have is really yours. Everything that you have is given by God and by His mercy and His grace. Now you think about it, right? One of you again might ask me, right? I work for 14 hours a day. I travel for two hours. I do everything. I am extremely smart, intelligent, and I'm talented. I have honed my skills to a level. And how can you tell me that everything, realize everything I do is from God? I have put in my work. I have done everything. Now I would ask you this question. Think about so many people who can't even devote that time. Think about so many people who can't even make that travel. Think about people who are differently able right now. God has given you so much. Where does that intelligence and that talent come from? It's a gift by God. Where did that education come from? God gifted your parents with the resources to educate you. So we need to realize that nothing that we have is from us. So basically when you're giving, all you're doing is God is giving you something and you're just giving back. God is giving you something and you're giving it back. That's all you're doing. Nothing you have, none of your resources, your time, the love you show, the faith you have, nothing is from you, all is from God. And you need to realize that. And the second point is, you need to know that your God is a lavish God. He, okay, let me just read this correctly. Know that your God is a lavish giving God and cultivate a desire to be more like Him. Your God gives you an abundance. All He's done is give, 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 give to each one of us. Show us mercy after mercy, show us forgiveness after forgiveness, get us out of situation after situation, give us more than we can handle when it comes to our resources. All we need to do is open our eyes. Your God is always giving, always giving you more and more. He's given you so much that He's only given His only begotten Son to you. Now think about it from a human aspect for a second. What more can you give a person? He's given his only begotten son. Is there anything bigger than that anybody can give you? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross. He died for our sins, rose again, and has now all authority on heaven and earth. He suffered for you. He suffered humiliation. He suffered pain. And most of all, he was forsaken by God for you and for your sins. God has given you the Holy Spirit for those who seek Him. He's there with us right now. He's walking with us. He's strengthening us. So all you have to do is realize all that your God has been doing is giving, 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 giving. And we need to give back. Otherwise, a Christian life is empty. It's purposeless. I was just thinking all the, all the work that I have done, all the things I've achieved in my life, in my work, feel in comparison to being a part of AKP right now. It gives me so much joy that at last I'm giving, and God has given me an opportunity to give back, that I'm going to work for something more than just sitting on my couch and designing something. And we just want to thank God. I want to thank God. I want to thank God because He's a lavish God, and I want you to realize that He's a lavish God. And even in the situations we are in, the troubles that we are in, He will come rescue us. He will give more, 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 more till our final day on this earth. Now to conclude, I would like to just say a word of prayer, right? Um, again, I want to talk to you. These are laws. They work by precision. These are nothing that has come out of my mouth or my intelligence. Everything I've said is supported by a verse. And I would like you to dwell on it again. So as we are praying, let's pray. First of all, let's pray for greater faith. No one has enough faith. We all every day need more and more faith. So let us pray for greater faith. The next point I want us to pray for is the ability to forgive. Let us pray for the ability to forgive and to forgive others. If there's somebody in your mind that comes right now, let us forgive that person and release them and release ourselves. It will be very easy for us to know who you have to forgive because by now God would have even put it in your mind. Let us pray for enlarging of our hearts to give, not only give material things, but give our time, care, effort, and, and 
more to the church, right? Um, I didn't even think about this, but every time when I think about giving, Anu, Dennis, and family come to my mind, right? Every single time, I sometimes come on Saturday working, even sometimes on a weekday, I see them coming and doing things for the church. And the best part about them, they're so silent about it. And I just want to thank you, Dennis and Anu and family, for the way you all serve the church. So let us ask also for enlarging our hearts to give. Let us just take two minutes to pray. Lord Father, I come before Thee, Lord. Pray, Father, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank You for Your mercy and Your grace. I thank You, Lord Jesus, for Your victory on the cross, Your victory over death, Satan, and all evil, Your resurrection, and Your all authority on heaven and earth. And thank You that we have power in Your name. I thank You, Lord Holy Spirit, for being with us, being our strength and our guide, our portion during this life and forever, my Lord. I praise You and I thank You. Today, as I come before Thee, Lord, I pray, Lord, for faith, Lord. I pray for faith in our situation, faith when things seem impossible, situation seems impossible, but we know that You are a God who will rescue us and there is no doubt about it. We know that You are a God that will take us out of the situation for because You have done it before, You will do it again, and we believe in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, for forgiveness, Lord. I pray for our hearts to have a more forgiving heart. If there's anyone in our life who we need to forgive, let us release them now, Lord. Let us forgive them, let us forgive them and release them and release ourselves, Lord, from this huge weight that we are carrying. I pray, Lord, to have a more giving heart. Help us to give more, more, more to you, Lord. And help us to receive in abundance and let it just be a cycle that goes. Let us not think that anything that we have is ours, Lord, but everything we, that we have is yours. I praise you and I thank you, my Lord. I give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all pray. Amen. Ashoka, not to you.